Greetings from London, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chatham House discussion on supporting Ukraine. Is the West doing enough? My name is Zarissa Lutsevich and I am the head of the Ukraine Forum here at Chatham House, which we have started eight years ago after the annexation of Crimea to really keep international attention on what is going on in Ukraine and how the West was all along the way trying to help Ukraine reform and also counter Russian aggression. Today we have an excellent panel to discuss the progress of war and a Western coalition to assist Ukraine. Our event is on the record and it's being conducted in two languages. Uh, there is a simultaneous Ukrainian translation and you can choose the channel you would like to tune in uh, either English or Ukrainian in the little globe button. So that is easy for you. We have some audiences tuning in also from Ukraine. Vitaim of us, Slava Ukraini. I will introduce our panel uh, in the order that they will be um, speaking um, and then participating in the discussion. But uh, we are still uh, living through a full-fledged war that continues in more than 80 days now, right here in the heart of Europe. And it is a war of destruction. It's a war that is causing havoc in Ukraine and on the whole of European continent. And the cascading effects throughout the globe were threatening food security, uh, threatening supplies of vital materials and uh, causing massive migration of people. Uh, and, and here is the main question that we want to ask today. We do hear from top level policymakers that Ukraine really has to be in the best possible place on the battlefield to repel Russian aggression, but also at the negotiating table to be able to negotiate from the position of strength, because uh, those supporting Ukraine see that Putin's victory is not in the interest neither of Ukraine nor Europe nor global rule based order. But is the West doing enough? Uh, the sixth package of sanction at the European Union seem to be stalled. There is, of course, the land lease passed by the United States, but the, the bill that is supposed to fill in the coffers with 40 billion is still not being voted in the Congress. So is the West delivering for what Ukraine needs to persevere and prevail? So we have Andriy Yermak, who is not new to Chatham House. He spoke with us just about two months ago in March. He's the head of president's office, but also somebody who was from the very beginning in his political career involved with dealing with Russia in the trilateral group. He was representing Ukraine as a senior advisor to the Normandy group. And has been, uh, I was just looking the last time this group met was actually on 26th of January, 2022 in Paris, right on the eve of aggression, still looking for a possible solution and avoiding this horrible aggression. So welcome, Andri, Vitaim of us, Chatham House. Then we have Tim Ash. He is a senior sovereign strategist at Blue Bay Asset Management in London. He is uh, our new associate fellow at Russia and Eurasia program. I think it's the first event uh, in Tim's capacity as, as one of our researchers. And we are really pleased to have Tim. He really knows economy, knows Ukraine, knows Russia he'll be able to unpack for us what these sanctions are actually delivering. Uh, then we have Elizabeth Bro, who is um, working at the American Enterprise Institute, specializing in resilience and gray zone defense. She is an author of Defender's Dilemma book that is identifying how we can deter gray zone aggression, something that Ukraine intimately you know, experienced up to the, uh, this aggression. And then last but not least, Mariana Bujarin, who is the research associate at the project on managing the atom at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, Belfer Center. Uh, Mariana is um, an expert on nuclear non-proliferation, but also somebody who has studied uh, the Budapest Memorandum and her book uh, called Inheriting the Bomb, Soviet Collapse and Nuclear Disarmament of Ukraine is forthcoming towards the end of this year. So we really have a group of experts who understand economics, who understand security. And I would like now to invite Andri Yermak to um, give his overview of, is the West doing enough? Where do you see the gaps? Uh, and how does this, this impact the situation on the ground in Ukraine? 
Andrei will be speaking in Ukrainian, so please switch on uh, to, the Ukra to the English channel to be able to hear interpretation. Andrei, vam slovo. Thank you, Arisa. Esteemed participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you for inviting me. I, I would uh, today, together with millions of Ukrainians, um, be wearing the Ukrainian embroidered shirt, the so-called Vishivanka, because it is today on the fourth uh, Thursday of May that we celebrate this day, um, national holiday. And uh, the issue that you've raised, uh, Orissa, ever get rid of the fence unless you know why it was erected. That's what uh, Rich the thing uh, Gilbert uh, Gil Charleston advises. So a uh, misunderstanding of the causes of the situation might uh, bring you to the misunderstanding of the outcomes, expected outcomes. You know the situation as it is in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is now successfully putting up resistance to one of the mi mighty armed forces of uh, the world for a much longer time than uh, expected. But you should understand that no concessions would have prevented the Russian invasion of Ukraine, bar uh, the unconditional capitulation, giving up our national identity, our sovereignty and territorial integrity. That is colonial status of our country. The political culture of Russia does not provide for this regime regime of dialogue because it leans on the language of force on dictate and uh, uh, this um, force was based on its cooperation with the West. Uh, it bought uh, influences at the expense of the money, of the proceeds um, of uh, fuel and fossil fuel uh, sales. Even uh, when uh, Russia demonstrated its uh, imperialistic ambitions in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Syria, and again uh, in Ukraine. Um, the Western countries uh, continue to uh, purchase uh, oil and gas and the money, the proceeds continue to fly and flow back to the Russian uh, Federation, but that should be stopped and the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine should be restored uh, to the full. So uh, this war should end in our victory common victory with the civilized world, because today Ukraine is defending not only itself, but it is a thermopolis of Europe, uh, and assistance to Ukraine is a way to remove uh, the clash between the policy of values and real politics. Not only is it um, uh, a token to the moral uh, choice, but it is also the invest, uh, investment in uh, the security of, uh, of the world. So uh, do not avoid building the fence when you know what it should uh, serve. And you should remember that this fence should uh, contain four uh, components arms for Ukraine, um, uh, stepping up sanctions, uh, then improving mechanisms for reparation and economic assistance, and fourth, establishing a reliable system of guarantees, security guarantees included. So I'll comment on all four of them. First, weapons. That's uh, what we still need badly. We are extremely thankful to our allies and partners for supplies of arms and uh, equipment. And we believe that all of the commitments in this domain will be met properly, but we still uh, need heavy weapons. We still lack uh, MRLS. Uh, I know this term. <laughs> I um, and uh, actually I will remember this term for the rest of my life. Th that equipment is uh, able to save uh, lives, not only of the military, but also the civilians, because to uh, Russians, civilians are also a legitimate target as well as civilian infrastructure. So we lose a lot. Uh, 
in terms of um, economic losses and losses of life. Occupation and uh, nuclear blackmail threat the globe. The impossibility of exploit one third of our arable lands and destruction by the Russian troops of agrarian transport infrastructure, blockade of our seaports are all elements of the overall strategy and playbook of uh, the Russian Federation. The threat of the food crisis and hunger in dozens of countries, and we hear about it from the UN leaders, is uh, looming. So uh, our uh, task is to uh, get peace as soon as possible. The longer the war protracts, uh, the higher the risk to all of the planet. But the peace should be just. The sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine is not a matter for compromise. Russia should uh, withdraw all its troops from all of our territories, including Ukrainian Donbas and Ukrainian Crimea. As you can see, the offensive of the Russian troops uh, is not successful, and they are trying to uh, go to the offensive to keep the uh, grabbed lands and create preconditions for a treaty that they will no doubt to uh, discard and dishonor, as it happened with two Minsk arrangements before. And that is not acceptable. We cannot allow the aggressor uh, to uh, grab territories in pieces to use this salami tactics. So uh, we have to uh, see step, uh, stepped up sanctions. Of course, they do not affect the um, combat operations directly, but they can curb Russia's um, opportunities and capacity to wage those wars. Uh, they will deprive Russia of materials and components necessary to build uh, new uh, weapons. So there should be a long-term effective punish punishment of the Russian Federation. And it will also uh, be a preventive policy towards other potential aggressors. So five uh, sanction packages are obviously not enough. Uh, in Late March, President Zineski initiated uh, a creation of the so-called sanction group. And I, in turn, suggested that my friend and uh, fr the friend of Ukraine, uh, Mike McFall, would bring together outstanding, uh, renowned international experts who would be looking into potential sanctions and into their efficiency and efficacy. And this has been a successful experience. And perhaps this format should also be rolled out to Europe. We are prepared to do that. In April, our team has presented an action plan to step up sanctions against the Russian Federation. The major purposes thereof are to introduce a full embargo uh, of uh, Russian power supplies, uh, then a blockade of the financial institutions and accesses to um, financial markets. We should also look into the coordination of all um, sanction partners and introducing secondary sanctions that uh, allow um, certain companies and uh, governments to circumvent uh, sanctions. And then we should make sure that it does not backfire on uh, the uh, sanction partners. It is also important to uh, recognize Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. That's extremely important. You will know that Lucien Simas has done that and a relevant resolution has been tabled to the US Congress. Uh, these acts should be followed by other states as well. On the 9th of May, our team uh, also presented a roadmap, the step-by-step -step strategy with recommendations to the EU member states on how to introduce energy-related sanctions. That's very important because uh, since uh, the 24th of February, the EU member states have daily paid uh, eight hundred billion dollars for uh, Russian oil and gas. And this money 
is used uh, to finance uh, the Russian aggression against our country. So, and we saw this facilitation of uh, war even before, in particular through the attempts to have uh, the Nord Stream uh, 2 project operational. And we warned that Russia would always consider such projects to be uh, the geopolitical weapon. And we um, did warn uh, against uh, this uh, gas and oil blackmail, but we were not heard. So we want uh, our partners to hear us now, and we suggest that uh, this opportunity to uh, win um, th those countries off uh, the uh, dependence on um, oil and gas of Russia uh, to uh, become materialized. Uh, so the uh, restructure uh, of the um, oil and gas consumption uh, is tantamount to the investment into the future of Europe. Energy uh, freedom, energy democracy would lead us to a better future. So we welcome the decision of the European Commission to introduce a total embargo on uh, the Russian oil. And we welcome the decisiveness of those governments who have agreed to do so. So our um, roadmap uh, also provides for a number of steps to mitigate the shock, uh, shock of uh, the embargo on uh, the industries of those countries. We also welcome uh, similar initiatives of the US uh, government to introduce um, taxes uh, and duties on uh, the Russian uh, oil to be introduced in the EU. And uh, the uh, proceeds of those taxes or uh, duties can be uh, channeled uh, to support Ukraine. And that brings me to the third point, that is uh, a reimbursement to Ukraine of the damage uh, caused by the Russian Federation. And here we have to address several issues. National courts and international arbitrations have no relevant jurisdiction. The European Court for Human Rights cannot enforce uh, the, uh, its judgments on uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, UN um, is paralyzed uh, by the fact that Russia is um, a permanent member of the security uh, council. Uh, and uh, those duties and taxes um, uh, can be imposed on uh, the imports and on uh, assets. But assets are protected by sovereign uh, immunity and the rights of oligarchs are protected by uh, the inviolability of private uh, property, uh, even though uh, Russia ignores international law and the capitals of uh, Putin's um, cronies um, have been uh, ill-begotten. So we have to uh, make sure that uh, uh, these the sanctions work. Uh, the president of Ukraine has established a working group, uh, uh, and I have the honor to chair this group of international and domestic um, experts, uh, Mark Kluczkiewski, Jeremy Sharp, Amal Clooney, and others who are working to design such a mechanism. And very soon it will be presented uh, to uh, the stakeholders. And we see this agreement of reparation as an element of of the post-war recovery of Ukraine. And we also expect that the regime for the maximum access of Ukrainian uh, goods to the markets of our allies and partners uh, would be introduced. Part of the so-called Marshall Plan for Ukraine, the case of Ukraine's recovery can be a success story to all uh, of Europe because it will be a large uh, investment and uh, construction spot uh, for many uh, interested parties. For example, uh, Denmark um, has committed to restore Mykolaiv uh, region. Uh, the UK would focus on Kiev region. And this format can be uh, expanded and extended to the whole territory of Ukraine. So Ukraine can become a showcase of democracy and uh, values because it will uh, combine all of the best practices at the value level and at the technology level because the crisis is about new 
opportunities, but those opportunities should be properly protected. And that leads me to the fourth item on my agenda. Uh, we um, now can trust only facts, and facts are uh, as follows. The uh, global uh, security architecture has been destroyed by Russia, and every day of the war is a stress test for global security structures, in particular the rescue of people from Mariupol, particularly from Azovstal Stillworth. And it is a huge challenge both to ICRC and the UN. And it's the largest uh, test over the last 70 uh, years. The UN and um, Secretary General, uh, Mr. Gutierrez, uh, with whom I um, contact several times a day, every day, um, uh, they are very actively engaged in this humanitarian mission in Mariupol. But we are speaking about the uh, outcomes of uh, aggression. But I would like to speak about preventing any further aggression. NATO is the only institution capable of providing the reliable protection, just I an umbrella of protection to its allies. But because of the national egotism of a number of states, it still pursues the uh, double standard policy. The alliance um, supports this illusion of the open doors to Ukraine, um, but uh, it does not uh, uh, preach what uh, or play, uh, practices what it uh, uh, preaches. So we have to look for some new mechanisms and new designs. We see no alternatives uh, to our EU membership. So any propositions on how uh, that uh, could be uh, substituted uh, are not acceptable to Ukraine or Ukrainians. The EU integration to us is not only a way to modernize and reform the country to enhance our GDP, but also a factor that will ensure our security and safety in the future. If you walk out into the street of Warsaw, Vilnius, Prague, or Paris, or else um, uh, Vienna, any uh, European capital city, and you ask people in the street what they think about the, a country that could uh, defend them from Russia in case of aggression, I'm sure that many of them would uh, name Ukraine as a country that is not a NATO uh, ally, nor is it a member of the EU. And today, uh, we are capable of being members uh, of those organizations and we could be a valuable asset to those organizations. And um, regular citizens of European uh, countries understand that pretty well. So should the European politicians uh, listen to the opinion of their uh, of their people, of their constituents. We have a very negative experience of Budapest uh, memorandum, and we see some attempts uh, to reconcile Ukraine with Russia on the Kremlin terms. But we should underscore that all security guarantees should be legally binding and they should be ratified by all the participating states. Of course, we cannot see Russia as one of the guarantors because it violates the fundamental principle of uh, the international law, Pacta Sunt Servanda. And it is unacceptable to even discuss uh, the opportunity of uh, off-ramps for the aggressor country. So our uh, dead and wounded would not allow us to accept such condition. So, uh, our task should be to deter the Russian Federation from further aggressions in the future. And that means to enhance defense capabilities of Ukraine. We have demonstrated to the whole world that we can withstand uh, the overcoming and overwhelming um, forces of uh, the enemy, but uh, we uh, do not think that uh, there should be li limits to the supplies um, of conventional arms to Ukraine that will allow us to restore our defensive capabilities, particularly uh, in the post-war 
time. Another key factor of a system of security guarantees should be the flexible and long-term sanction policies. And this set of security measures could be a testing site for the further global coalition of responsible countries that would be prepared within 24 hours to respond effectively to any aggression. May I remind you that uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine back in March uh, proposed a new form Format of cooperation. We call it U24, United 24. In order to uh, set up this uh, system, we will have to modernize international law. We will have to expand the definition of aggression by including the tools of uh, the modern hybrid warfare. And basic international institutions should be reformed. Common sense. Um, says that not a single country can be a UN member uh, while it behaves as an aggressor. And it should uh, lose all of its uh, rights um, as a member of the EU on the first day of uh, its aggression. And this U24 system could then, uh, could then be rolled out to uh, the global scale because uh, the world of today is increasingly integrated. And if uh, somebody believes that they can discard the rules of civilized cohabitation, coexistence, then perhaps those are the ones whom Robert Robert Frost uh, uh, meant when he said, good fences make good neighbors. Thank you very much for your attention. I would also like to thank all of you for uh, your support of Ukraine. And may I repeat yet again that I'm sure that our speedy victory will be our common victory. And every effort uh, that our partners and uh, friends invest in uh, this victory will be uh, remembered forever because uh, this is not only a Ukrainian war, but it's a Ukrainian war for a uh, uh, universal war for democracy. People to unpack and maybe get a bit of um, clarity on also how, how the West is actually performing along those lines to meet Ukrainians' expectations. And uh, one thing for sure, because you've uh, invoked this metaphor of a fence, is very much depends what will be happening on the other side of the fence in Russia. And this is why the sanctions and oil embargo um, are so critical. Uh, and now I want to turn into Tim Ash to give us his view on whether current uh, level of Western sanctions is really undermining Putin's capacity to wage war. What is his um, prediction on the oil, uh, energy embargo and how it may proceed? And uh, what actually could be done to make it faster? Because as Andre says, things have to happen in the right time, in the right place. Tim, over well, to you. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Arisia, and, and thank you, Andre, and uh, you know, Slava Ukraine, you guys are fighting for us and defending our democracy. Right, and, and we're very uh, grateful to you. I think we should be, I mean, in answer to your question, Arisia, the answer is no, right? I, I mean, maybe I should stop there in terms of we are not doing enough because Russia is continuing the aggression. So I think that's clear cut. Um, I think on sanctions, but, but you know, stepping back a bit and, and looking where we are compared to where we thought we were gonna be. I mean, it's pretty incredible. I mean, I think no one, including Putin expected the level of sanctions on Russia, you know, in terms of what we've got. And I think maybe, you know, that, that uh, unfortunately that reflects on, uh, you know, pretty disappointing sanctions experience over the period since Crimea. You know, in effect, we didn't do enough. We were too soft. Uh, we sent the wrong messages to Moscow. If we'd have sent stronger messages much earlier, maybe he wouldn't have invaded in the first place because he would have realized that the mother of all sanctions packages was going to result uh, from the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. But I mean, just going through the list, you know, again, this idea that, I mean, no one imagined uh, that even with an invasion of Ukraine, we would see the Central Bank of Russian assets sanctioned. You know, uh, probably half around 300 billion has been frozen. Um, I know we're not there yet, and Andre mentioned it, but, you know, there is a real possibility 
that uh, CBR sanctions, so, uh, sorry, CBR assets will be used for reparations. You know, y y Janet Yellen made a statement this week suggesting that, you know, the laws weren't there yet, but I think the clear indication is that laws, you know, can be changed. You know, and we there are precedents, obviously, with uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion uh, of Kuwait, uh, you know, the first Gulf War, etc. Uh, things can happen, and we've seen that again. Uh, you know, the, the, the bravery of the Ukrainians has embarrassed the West. I mean, that's the reality. We are where we are. We're far further in terms of sanctions because, you know, Ukrainian bravery is, 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 is reflected on the fact that we haven't done enough over many years. Just going through the list again. So CBR. Assets uh, frozen, remarkable. Swift, you know, the big debate we've had, painful debate we've had in the lead up to the war. In the end, you know, Swift, the, you know, bank, significant banks have been blocked off from Swift, significant banks have been sanctioned. Uh, looming and, and a really, really critical decision coming, May 25th, the general license on Russia's ability to continue to service external debt. It seems very likely that the US Treasury will not extend that general license, which will force Russia into formal default. Remarkable, actually, again, pretty remarkable that US Treasury is, uh, you know, preventing Russia's pay Western creditors, right? So it, it shows a, a willingness to take pain. You know, sanctions is always this game about trying to figure out, trying to minimize the damage to yourself, maximize the damage uh, to the, the target of sanctions. Uh, in this particular case, I think the realization is done that actually forcing Russia into default will be hugely painful for Russia, right? It will be painful for some foreign creditors, but actually uh, a Russian default will hurt Russia for a very long period of time because uh, Russia will not be able to come out of default until OFAC, the US Treasury, uh, tells foreign creditors that they're able to negotiate with Russia to come out of default. So Russia could well be in default for a decade. What does that mean? Well, as long as Russia stays in default, uh, it will not be able to access international capital markets. Its cost of borrowing will be very elevated. Even people like the Chinese will be very reluctant to lend to Russia while the country is in default. And again, if they do lend to Russia, they will lend at prohibitive rates of interest. So this is a, this is a, a mega, mega hit for Russia, actually. And it will have an impact, okay, it will not crash Russian markets. Uh, well, they have crashed actually in the last three months, but I mean, it's not gonna uh, destroy the Russian economy in the long term, but it will you know, slow capital inflows, increase the capital cap cost of capital, reduce investment, reduce long-term growth. And it will, you know, what, what's I think clear for me now, I think it's probably clear for all of us, that you know, Russia's military campaign has been a disaster. You know, Russian military kit has underperformed, its tactics have been atrocious, its soldiers don't want to fight. The opposite of the Ukrainians, right? Uh, but, you know, to continue the war, Russia, it's clear Russia needs to rebuild its military uh, machine, right? That will cost money. Uh, as long as Russia's, you know, out of international capital markets, uh, it will not be able to re re rebuild this Russian military uh, machine very quickly. Uh, and that's part of the calculation, I would imagine, for Putin, right? I mean, um, you know, so it, it, that is very damaging. Uh, I, I think the hope is that the uh, US Treasury does not extend the general license on May 25th. Russia will formally go into default. And actually, interestingly, for Putin, that's a, a PR disaster. If you remember after the 98 default, uh, Putin obviously took off his 99, won the election. One of the first things he did was he went off and met Schroeder. Uh, there was a Paris club. Uh, there was a debate about whether Russia was going to default on Paris club liabilities. And Putin surprised everyone and told Schroeder that he was going to pay because uh, a, a great power like Russia should not go into default. You know, it should be able to pay its way in the world. So this May 25th designation or, or extension of the general license, if Russia's going to default, huge humiliation for Putin, actually, huge hum humiliation. Uh, and again, it will be an, one, another one of the factors that I think will weigh on Putin and the Russian establishment about the, 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 the wherewithal or the, the cleverness of, of continuing to uh, continue this campaign. Um, so look, um, the sanctions have gone much further than anyone expected. Uh, the fact that we're even talking about energy sanctions 
uh, is remarkable in its own right. Remember again, pre-invasion, it was kind of off limits. You know, it's going to wreck the European economy. All this. We're actually talking about, and even if the Hungarians uh, do manage to block uh, the sanctions pack, well, the energy sanctions package that Europe is going to try and roll out. You know, people. You know, the US are talking with Europeans of, of ways around it. Obviously, there's talk about a tax on Russian oil exports, uh, price cap, lots of ways to do it. But there is a determination, I think, to go there. There's an understanding that. Uh, that Putin only, res only respects power uh, and that, you know, this cutting off uh, the energy sector, a key funder of his, obviously the Russian economy and the Russian war machine is, is really critical. And I would say, <laughs> irrespective, though, of whether we see uh, actual, uh, an actual en energy embargo sooner rather than later, what is absolutely cr cr crystal clear now because of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, uh, Europe will diversify away from Russian energy. I mean, the golden goose has, has died because of this invasion, right? Europe has realized that Russia is a security threat to Europe uh, and uh, it is an unreliable energy partner, right? So uh, longer term, Russia is going to be screwed because no access to capital markets, default, lots of sanctions, SWIFT, all that kind of stuff. But also in the end, it's, uh, it's commodity, dollar printing machine uh, will, will be uh, much reduced, not over the longer term, actually, over the short to medium term. You know, I think people are serious. I mean, this, you know, I, th I think many Europeans in particular uh, didn't take the threat from Putin seriously. The invasion has obviously clarified people's minds. It's now crystal clear uh, what needs to be done. Uh, now, you know, uh, more needs to be, I would argue that, I mean, there's obviously a debate about whether Europe can bear the cost of, of a full energy embargo, right? And, you know, there's lots of studies been done, there's, particularly in terms of Germany and the cost of the German economy. And, you know, the, the, you know estimates range from one to five percent of GDP contraction with a full energy embargo. Right. I mean, I would argue, <laughs> you know, what is the price of security? You know, Putin is, you know, the, the, you know we, either, we either bear this cost now and it's going to be very disruptive, clearly for the European economy. Uh, or we have to bear this cost over the longer term in terms of increased defence spending, you know, more migrants coming into Europe. Well, not unfortunately, we, you know, Ukrainians are great people and they work really hard and they contribute. But, you know, you know, we either have to address this now. And if it means an energy embargo, you know, I think a, 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 even a 5% GDP contraction in Germany is worth it. We're talking about the strongest economy in Europe with the strongest fiscal space well able to deploy fiscal resources to counteract the impact of an energy embargo. But in the end, look, it's about politics. Obviously, the Hungarians are not helping things out particularly. But, um, but anyway, uh, I think we are, going, we are going, in any event, Europe will diversify away from Russian energy. That's catastrophic for the Russian economy. Uh, and let's hope that actually we see some fix that will accelerate that process to restrict uh, Russia's ability to, to sell energy products in Europe and reduce the, 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 the flow of dollars to the Russian economy. Uh, may, maybe one last yes, thing. Yeah, one last thing. One minute, if you may. Yeah, okay. Uh, look, I mean, I mean I, what's interesting for me, I'm going out of my area of sanctions a little bit, but uh, I think we all thought that Putin had the domination of escalation in this conflict, right? You know, continuously is, is bullied, Actually, well, I think what we've maybe learned in recent weeks is that uh, uh, with things like sanctions, but also arms supplies like, you know, T-72s, MiG-29s, Putin set these red lines in recent months and actually he hasn't responded. He hasn't escalated. Right. I mean, Europe and the West have been frightened of Putin, frightened of doing, you know, he, he, he spoke about Swiss sanctions as being the declaration of war. Well, we've done it and he hasn't really done anything in response. So I, I guess the message here is that Putin actually is a bully. And what we've learned is, you know, uh, confront him, uh, cross his red lines, support Ukraine, arm Ukraine, help it in terms of, you know, sanctions on Russia, et cetera. Don't, don't, be, don't, be, uh, don't be scared of Putin, actually. I mean, the messaging seems to be the guy's on the back foot and he's not willing to escalate, right? I mean, concerns about use of weapons of mass destruction, all that thing, he hasn't, right? Despite the kind of rhetoric on Russian TV. So anyway, look, uh, very quickly, I'll end there. Uh, just, just, just to summarize, 
Uh, we, we've gone further than anyone expected. These sanctions will have a very significant effect on the Russian economy long term. Uh, they may not absolutely crash the economy in the short term, but I think it is, it, it's going to be a really key uh, decision point in terms of Putin's overall decision about whether he, whether he moderates, whether he, go, he wants to go to the, in, uh, to the peace table, etc. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tim. I think so in, in a big um, scale of things, clearly Ukraine may be bearing quite a lot of destruction at this point, you know, with quite big depopulation flows and destruction of, of its cities. But in the long term, it may come out stronger out of this war while Russia, with the transit it sets through this aggression by decoupling itself from the global economy, will uh, will diminish its uh, its influence and who knows may even start having a serious trouble governing russia from within um and and that is also a side effect of all of this so um i, I would like now to bring in elizabeth and um ask more on again on a military and security um, um track because andre mentioned also eu membership as one of the possible security guarantees for Ukraine, something that clearly in Ukraine's mind, membership of the European Union means part of Ukraine's victory in this war, but also uh, the role of, of European uh, allies in su supporting Ukraine's resilience, uh, supporting Ukraine's territorial defense. I know that you studied quite a lot the uh, interlink between uh, military and, and civilian cooperation in times of this kind of total war. So how do you see uh, Europeans' effort and where do you see more opportunity to uh, boost up Ukraine's defenses? Elizabeth. Thank you very much, uh, Orisia. I thought I would uh, just mention some numbers first regarding how much military assistance uh, various friends of Ukraine, meaning uh, allied or partner countries have provided. And uh, the Institute for World Economics uh, at the University of Kiel uh, have fantastic, uh, they are doing fantastic work collating these figures. So uh, for example, uh, so they, they don't have every country, but between January 24th and the 10th of May this year, uh, the US uh, donors, so this is all in euros, donated almost 25 uh, billion uh, uh, euros worth of weapons, uh, uh, other military equipment and financial aid with a military purpose. The UK, uh, two and a half billion Poland, uh, one and a half billion the EU, uh, which is the Commission and the Council, about two billion, uh, then uh, Germany, Canada, Norway, Estonia, Latvia, France, Italy, and Czech Republic are the other countries mentioned there, all with lower figures. But then if you look at, uh, if you take it uh, as a, um, as a percent of GDP, uh, two countries stand out, uh, Estonia and Latvia. Estonia has given more than 0.8 percent of its GDP's uh, GDP, uh, the equivalent of 0.8 percent of its GDP uh, in, in um, aid to uh, bilateral uh, commitments to Ukraine, meaning uh, commitments from Estonia alone. Uh, it's closely followed by Latvia, then Poland, then US, then Lithuania, the UK, and so forth. So it's, it's really quite a different picture if you look at uh, the, the country's uh, economy, the size of the country's economy. But what I, I want to, to highlight is, first of all, the, the incredible outpouring we have seen, especially from Estonia and Latvia, but from many other countries as well, in, in, uh, in giving, uh, providing whatever military equipment they, they can free up. To, to give to Ukraine. And yes, there are differences obviously between allies and, and there's a big discussion. Uh, there is, has been since the beginning of the war, a big discussion uh, in Germany about how much uh, to give. And now uh, it, that brings me to another aspect, which is the logistics. You can commit and all this, all these figures we're seeing, that's commitments, but how do you actually get the, the equipment you're trying to donate uh, to Ukraine? How do you get it to where it needs to be? And this is where we're seeing uh, a new phase of this war where the, the equipment has to travel not to, to Lviv uh, and, and be uh, taken into the Ukrainian's position there, but to uh, the eastern part of the country. And it, it, it would be it would be better to get it into the eastern part of the country so it doesn't have to cross. Uh, Andrew can obviously talk much more about this, but that's a, a, a challenge where I think other allies, uh, other friends of Ukraine will be called upon. For example, can Turkey play a role in being the, the hub uh, for such deliveries and possibly for, for 
for the equipment to, to traverse the Black Sea. Uh, of course, we civilians and, and outside watchers don't know how the equipment is traveling, and that, uh, that's a very good thing. Nobody except the, the parties involved should know how it gets there, but it is a, a really important challenge, the logistics of it. So one aspect is, is committing the money, committing the equipment. The other aspect is getting it there, and it's, it's really a miracle that, that they've managed to get it uh, to uh, the Ukrainian uh, forces that need it uh, so efficiently until now. Um, uh, but just one more point, Germany has uh, committed a number of uh, Gepard uh, uh, vehicles, and that's that's fine, but it so, just so happens that this is a vehicle that, that the Germans uh, are not actively using anymore, so they're, they're, it's fine that they have, that they've been keeping it for a rainy day, but they don't have ammunition for it, which means that they've been going around um, um, hat in hand, as it were, uh, to various countries that do use the Gepard, and uh, they have now, uh, Brazil is the largest of those countries, and this is a major step. Brazil uh, has committed to providing ammunition, which is really quite something, considering how close Bolsonaro is to Putin. So that, that is not to, was not to be taken for granted, and frankly, I, I didn't think it would happen, uh, but, but it, it has happened, and I'm sure Andrew can, can uh, comment on that as well. Uh, that brings me to a third point, which is the popular support for, for these uh, donations, these measures, this, uh, um, uh, this uh, military, uh, provision of military equipment. And because in our liberal democracies, governments uh, clearly have to listen to the voice of the people. And so far, uh, there has been a lot of support in Western countries, even countries that traditionally have not provided military equipment, including my own home country of Sweden, which went out on a limb. Uh, for, for Sweden, it's a limb and, and provided uh, military equipment uh, to Ukraine, which is, has arrived and is being used to great effect against the Russians. Uh, but uh, an alarming or concerning sign is appearing from my perspective in the US, and Mariana, you may want to come in on this as well, where there is uh, uh, opposition now in Republican ranks to uh, a very large uh, package that the President Biden wants to provide to, to Ukraine. And Republicans are saying, some, some Republicans and grassroots are saying, well, how come they are the Ukrainians are, are getting all this money? We need to, to look after American problems first. Um, um, so we'll see that that discussion, that debate, which will no doubt be very, uh, uh, very divisive, be carried out over the next few days and weeks. But that brings me to another point, which is societal resilience, which, uh, as you said, uh, Aresia is something I, I, I work on a great deal. And it was fantastic. It has been fantastic to see in these past uh, almost two months. Uh, how the Ukrainian, how Ukrainian society, civil society has risen to this challenge in, in unbelievable ways. And this is, I, 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 I would like to know how Russian military intelligence works, because that's something they should have picked up on that. There was this commitment among the Ukrainian population, even though they may, they may have various grievances about how the country is run on a, on a daily basis in peacetime, but the, the, uh, I, the, their commitment to do it uh, to, uh, among a, a very large population, part of the population, to do their part in this war effort. And uh, if, if I may bring in a historical example, that's the same mistake the Soviets made in 1939 when they invaded Finland and didn't uh, even reckon, uh, clearly didn't reckon with the amount of popular support that was for, for defending the country and where people. Um, people did their part in sort of backing up the armed forces, which were very small and were mostly composed of, of reservists, but the rest of the country backed them up, did their part, and that's what we're seeing in Ukraine. And I know uh, the time is almost up, but I think it, it's, it's a really important lesson how, uh, how absolutely decisive popular support, societal resilience is in times of crisis. And unfortunately, well, fortunate, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, um, uh, it, it wasn't clear uh, until the 24th of February that that's what would come to pass. And President Zelensky obviously was in a really difficult position having to, um, having to uh, signal to the world uh, because of, of uh, the, the risk of, of capital flight and investors uh, leaving the country had to signal to the world until the 23rd of February that don't worry about the, the don't, 
let's not exaggerate the risk of war. Ukraine is fine. That's what he had to communicate. But in order for, for the Ukrainian population to, to get ready for this monumental task, he would have had to also communicate that they should get ready for this monumental task. So it is a, it is a dilemma. What do you communicate? But the good thing about societal resilience is that it's it's not uh, offensive because it's, it's about uh, just keeping yourself and your society safe. So it's something that you can build in peacetime and that you can uh, build uh, and, and, and exercise without uh, it causing any escalation because it doesn't pose a threat to anybody else. And, and so that's, I think, the lesson to be learned from, from this war, that this is something that countries can focus on because if Ukraine can do it under such dire circumstances, uh, other countries should be able to do, as, uh, do it as well. And with that, over to you, Oris, yeah. Yes, thanks. I think it's interesting where maybe we should also bring in the link between societal resilience and this U United 24 idea, because something that Andre was talking about, the speed of change, challenges, and how uh, society and local government and central government has to be ready. And if we do it together in the Build Bear Coalition, clearly we'd be all better off in the end, but maybe it will come up in a discussion. But now I want to turn into Mariana because you know she she's been in uh, uh, the United States, engaged in the security debate around Ukraine, looking at also at you know the possible uh, risks of that escalatory dominance that Tim was saying. What's left in there for Russia? And of course, there were a lot of questions on nuclear and weapons of mass destruction, the possible use of that. But Mariana, how do you see? Washington is playing that role and what you've heard from Andre also about this idea of um, um, a new alliance uh, to rapidly respond to security risks where nuclear non-nuclear countries are coming in do they have different responsibilities so I would like to hear from you over to you well thank you so much Oris, and thank you to all the panelists for their really interesting reflections uh it's always a tall task to go last because so many uh, brilliant things have already been uh, said uh before i respond more directly to your question i'd like us to kind of step back and you know when we think of what the west can do um for ukraine and for for finding the, the proper ways and the, the the, the fitting ways of supporting Ukraine. I think one of the fat first tasks is to really ask uh, an introspect about why this war is happening. What are the root causes there? What are some of the systemic factors that came together uh, that made it possible? Um, and I think if, if there's um, one instance in which this very unhelpful narrative of, oh, the West expanded NATO and provoked Putin, and now he's lashing out as a kind of cornered bear. Uh, I think that narrative is uh, has to be shelved and, and actually uh, put in a dustbin of history, um, so to speak, because it certainly does not bear out, right? So what we see today is really issued from the kind of post-Soviet security settlement that took place in, in the early 1990s. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, Ukraine as a as a Soviet successor state had really um, there were three models right in which Ukraine could provide for its security. Uh, one was kind of the Belarus model, right? It was to to join the the space, the strategic military space dominated uh, by Russia. Another one was. Uh, you know, the Baltic model, right, to go west and integrate with your Atlantic structures. And the third was perhaps kind of this garrison state model, this self-reliance model. Uh, Ukraine clearly um, did not, Ukrainian population, Ukrainian people did not take kindly to or did not support the Belarus model. There just wasn't enough uh, a popular grassroots support for that. Um, the, the certain states, as, as Mr. Yermak had uh, uh, helpfully pointed out, certain states in Euro Atlantic structures were, uh, were not particularly supportive of Ukraine's Euro Atlantic uh, choices. And that's why that progressed, even though eventually it became uh, sort of an aspirational model for Ukraine has not made much progress. In the middle, what was left was essentially this neutrality of Ukraine of which we are talking about. And uh, that neutrality had to rely in any, uh, to be sustainable on some kind of military 
strength, right? And uh, to be fair, Ukraine could have done a lot more over the last of the over the past thirty years to build up its own defenses. We have discovered in two thousand fourteen just how neglected Ukrainian military had been uh, on the inside, and for for whatever for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to go into it. But that was a very painful lesson that I think Ukraine has learned uh, very well. But even in this. Um, in this kind of even assuming that Ukraine could have done the best a state could, right, to build this kind of up, to build up its defenses independently, to provide for its security independently. It is not the kind of security environment in which that model could have been sustainable, uh, simply because Ukraine found itself at kind of the stick, at this, this cusp of two competing models of two competing systems, right? A system to the West, there was a system of integration, right? A security system in which states come together based on joint values and joint interests, and in which uh, sovereignty is respected to the extent that even small states have a voice and, and are sort of accepted as equals. And to the East, the Russian model was the model of domination, was exactly as, as Mr. Yermak pointed out, is this kind of real politiki, very vertical model of, you know, the, the small states are just pawns on the chessboard of great powers and they're being moved around. And therefore, you know, even when Russia was, uh, was talking about Ukraine's neutrality, he was talking about you over Ukraine's head to the Western states because those were the only, uh, you know, United States was the only interlocutor even worth talking about, you know? So, um, you know, um, these, these, these are very, it's not really democracy per se versus autocracy, but these are very different models of, of kind of being in the, in the international relations, being in security. And therefore having a, a large country, a large swath of Europe, such as Ukraine, left in that kind of security vacuum with expanded NATO to the east and a very resurgent uh, domineering uh, Russia to, uh, uh, meaning <laughs> NATO to the west and, and Russia to the east, was, was, was a perilous situation rife with this kind of conflict. So in retrospect, as it were, it is not surprising that places like, you know, uh, uh, Moldova with Transnistria, uh, Georgia with, um, uh, with Abkhazia, and now Ukraine have become basically these, these um, settings for, uh, for military conflict and now a full-scale war. So the first thing the West can do is actually understand that and admit it that, 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 that these are kind of these pathologies of post-Soviet collapse. Having understood that, the West needs to stop reacting and start, start kind of taking on initiative. So not just responding to Ukraine's pleas for military assistance, which has been, you know, as Elizabeth and, uh, and all of us have admitted, uh, uh, talked about, has been significant, right? But those are responses, right? Those are reactions to Ukrainian um, requests. Uh, in order to stop reacting and start um, taking, taking initiative, we need to think several steps in advance, right? The, uh, in, in the very kind of operational level, it is um, to, to admit that this war will not be over very, very soon, that the equipment that is being provided to Ukraine, especially um, the air defenses, uh, right, that, that are still protecting Ukrainian cities and civilians and uh, uh, helping Ukraine kind of maintain um, the security of its airspace, Russia does not have um, uh, air dominance uh, just yet, uh, is to, to admit that Ukrainian air defenses and missile defenses will get degraded. They are getting degraded. They will get attrited. So uh, we need to start um, thinking about these the new uh, equ defensive equipment, but also equipment, military equipment that will uh, help Ukraine regain its territory and start training it in now. A lot of these systems take training. They're not familiar to Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, these these are the few steps ahead that we need to be thinking. Uh, that's kind of short term and medium term. In the long term, this kind of security vacuum in which Ukraine has found itself needs to be 
close needs to be for that there needs to be a long term sustainable security solution for Ukraine, but also perhaps um, you know states that find itself found themselves in a similar situation. Uh, historically speaking, actually Budapest Memorandum was the opportunity to do just that. Right. This is what Ukraine was demanding then. It was demanding robustly. It wasn't demanding NATO membership. It wasn't demanding integration into Western security structures. It said, if we are going to remain in this neighborhood and be secure, we need some sort of robust security guarantees, um, you know, outside of alliances, uh, formal alliances. Uh, and at that point, again, for a variety of reasons, one which, you know, was kind of this hopeful, rosy thinking that, uh, you know, security dilemmas in, in Europe could be uh, overcome, and we're entering this new era in which we're all going to, you know, cooperate and sit around and, and sing kumbaya. Um, these, um, these demands were not met with, uh, you know, sufficient seriousness, um, and were not, you know, Ukrainians knew very well not only what they were getting in the Budapest Memorandum, but what they were not getting, right? All of this came to bear in 2014 uh, and today. So um, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the negative uh, repercussions of the breach of the Budapest Memorandum, of the breach of these security assurances will mean that a lot more and a lot more robust uh, structures would have to be um, put in place exactly in order to overcome uh, this, this kind of negative history. Uh, and in that, um, you know, perhaps again, NATO is not the correct solution for Ukraine at this point, but there needs to be, if not a multilateral, then a minilateral format in which um, there would be a, a treaty, uh, there would be a security um, solution uh, in which not only countries would commit to Ukraine's territorial integrity, like in the Budapest Memorandum, but in which there would be specified very robust. Uh, Kind of consequences for breaching uh, these commitments. This is what the Budapest Memorandum was lacking, right? So uh, these consequences are not there for punishment. These consequences are there for deterrence to prevent the breach uh, of of the settlement in the first place. Um, even more broadly, and I will finish with this. All of us need to think very, very hard about the role of nuclear weapons in the world and how the global nuclear war order will be shifted by this war in Ukraine. Because um, what we see is, the, um, as Tim was saying, the, the, the West was sort of, uh, you know, behaved as if it wasn't a nuclear armed state that also relies for its security on a nuclear deterrent, but uh, someone who was just very easily deterred uh, by Russia's nuclear threats, right? Um, and uh, uh, the in Russia, we see that because it has been uncovered, it has been uh, revealed to the world that the Russian conventional might is not 10 feet tall as, as some of us uh, and some people in the West have thought, then um, there will be uh, predictably an increased uh, reliance on the nuclear component of Russia's military might. Um, and haven't spent so much time as, as nuclear experts about thinking how you know to prevent war, uh, nuclear war between two nuclear armed adversaries and how deterrence works and how you know second strike uh, survivability and all of these things. We have not spent enough time, far less time, with thinking how to deter a nuclear use by a nuclear weapon state against a non-nuclear weapon state. Um, the international structures for that are far too weak. Uh, and all of us need to be uh, thinking very, very hard. Unfortunately, I don't have a quick and ready answer uh, for how to solve that predicament. Thank that you. That is a preferred academic ending to pose another research question. And I see Andre is already picking up his hand. And then maybe, Andre, I know you've been discussing about the security guarantees I mean, brainstorming probably with your partners of how could that look like? And uh, you focus specifically on robust consequences, whether it's economic sanctions, whether it's 
uh, cyber response, depending on what the situation calls for. So I'll, I'll pass the floor to you to respond. And also, uh, maybe if you can take a note of a few more questions that were asked specifically to you in the chat. One was about non-Ukrainian leaders, such as Scholz and, and Macron, trying to negotiate with Putin. Is that helpful to Ukraine? Do you like uh, your allies to talk directly to Putin and try to negotiate? And there was also a question about sanctions on Belarus. Um, should there be sanctions imposed at the level similar to Russia uh, on Belarus that is in, enable Russian aggression and also in a way probably allows Russia to bypass some of Western sanctions. So I'm passing over to Kiev. Thank you very much, Orissa. Uh, uh, I would like to thank all of the panelists for uh, most insightful comments. First of all, I would like to respond to some of them. First of all, when it comes to Elizabeth's uh, idea that it's exactly because we uh, received intelligence data from our partners and we treated it most seriously. And we did prepare for the uh, imminent threat, but we did not advertise it publicly. We did not discuss it publicly. Uh, that we ha had managed to save our society from panic, not for them not to um, succumb to panic. And the economic situation remained more or less stable before the war. And now we see that our military was prepared to what happened on the 24th of February. And we see uh, how valiantly and um, competently they are um, fighting uh, at the uh, battlefield. And can you imagine any other country uh, in the world uh, in the 85th day of the all out aggression by one of the mightiest armies of the world would remain fully controlled with infrastructure uh, up and running with the banking sector operating with pensions and salaries being paid with uh, financial support being extended to uh, people most in need. Can you imagine what, what could have happened hadn't we exercised caution and, and control uh, before the war. So we had done whatever we could at that time. Of course, we uh, did discuss preventive sanctions with our Western allies. And we insisted that those should be preventive sanctions. They should have been introduced before the aggression. And they uh, should have also envisioned military assistance to Ukraine. Had that happened, I think that our partners would have provided a much bigger and much um, more effective as military assistance to us. Now responding to what Mariana has said. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for what I've heard from you, that the West should finally not only respond uh, to Ukraine's re uh, request, but also to initiate certain steps, to shoulder responsibility and to provide Ukraine with more equipment in order to protect 
civilians. And I do agree with you that anti-aircraft defense, air defense is key here. And we had started to discuss uh, this very issue long before Putin launched his aggression. Even in Chatham House, I uh, raised these issues. We spoke about airfields and their, uh, their defense. And here we have to be very honest and look back and recollect that when Ukraine gained independence that we are actually defending today, as well as our freedom and uh, sovereignty. At that time, the West looked at Ukraine as a minor partner, not as an equal one. And when we were disarmed in nuclear terms, while Russia was increasing their defensive and offensive capabilities. It was done at Ukraine's expense, and that was a huge mistake. And now Ukrainian people have to pay this immense price for that mistake. Never will we return to Ukraine's being treated without due respect, because today the US, the UK, the EU member states, all of them are treating us as equals, because today we have managed to show that we are strong, we are resilient, we share European values, and we are prepared to give our lives for those values. And finally, uh, the West have started to trust us at this immense price, at the price of uh, lives of our civilians and uh, servicemen and servicewomen. But in the future, whenever Ukrainian comes to a foreign country showing their passport or starting speaking Ukrainian, he or she will see respect and admiration on the part of people in those respective countries. And I'm sure that our bilateral and multilateral relations would uh, be based on uh, those equal bases, on the equal footing. And we know fairly well that Ukraine needs the world as well as the world needs Ukraine. And we can be part of those multilateral alliances, not as guests, but as leaders, sometimes as co-founders of new alliances, because today our nation, our people have deserved this respect and this new attitude. And uh, now uh, I'm uh, prepared to answer your questions, Arisa, right now. Now, as far as uh, the uh, negotiations of our partners with Russia, direct negotiations with Russia are concerned. If they do that openly, if they thus promote our uh, common positions, if they do so for the sake of putting an end to this war, without compromising or prejudicing the interests of Ukraine, its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We are all in for it. And 
we hope that many uh, of our partners talk to Russia with those aims in mind. If anybody wants to talk to Putin or Russians, offering something that is not acceptable to Ukraine, they, I think that it will lead them nowhere because it is up to the Ukrainian people to decide their own fate. That's what I think about it. But you should remember but that the world would not be the same after this war. And uh, any mediation, intermediacy, facilitation, uh, brokerage that uh, could be imagined within the Normandy format would not be acceptable today. Today, there is no middle ground between uh, good and evil. You are either with the good or siding with good or with evil. But as I said before, we welcome what the UN uh, is doing. We are grateful to everyone who attempts to help Ukraine. At the same time, I'm sure that our position should be clear cut because uh, the policy of appeasement of the aggressor of the Russian Federation is history now. As far as Belarus is concerned, of course, the first missiles were launched from the territory of Belarus. Belarus served as a launch pad uh, for those uh, missiles. Equipment moved uh, to, uh, towards the Ukrainian border from the territory of Belarus. And Belarus should be held accountable for that. Its government should be held accountable. At the same time, Belarus uh, uh, has not let uh, the Russian Federation uh, drag itself into this war directly. So the logic of sanctions and of accountability should be fair. And it should be personified. That is, we cannot equalize uh, the positions of the open aggressor the Russian Federation, and that of a country that let its territory be used by the aggressor, that aided and debated to a certain extent in this aggression, but does not engage in this aggression directly. So there should be differentiation. Otherwise, uh, Belarus uh, might be Sh uh, shoved to some risky behavior. So we should uh, use every diplomatic opportunity to engage in a sort of a dialogue with uh, Belarus for Belarus to eventually close its territory for the use by the Russian Federation in order to escalate this aggression. That's what I wanted to tell you. Very clear. So maybe now I would like to bring in Tim Ash because there were several questions and I'll group them all together. Apologies, I'm not giving names of the people who ask questions, but there was one question on economic assistance to Ukraine specifically. You know that Ukraine's budget is probably half and half now supported by Ukraine's own domestic, you know, war bonds and income, but also grants and, and loans from the West. What should be done to prevent in inflation skyrocketing to ensure that all those 
uh, payments to vulnerable groups that Andre was mentioning that right now it goes on that it continues like that because uh, uh, Janet Yellen said we are falling short of uh, uh, funding for Ukraine. Do you agree with her? Uh, and also specifically there was a question to you on UK, what more UK could be do could do in, in, uh, in economic measures. And finally, the third one to you was about um, with the reconstruction and post-conflict economy, how do we ensure that, you know, the financial assistance, of course, is safeguarded from corruption? Uh, oh, good last question. Uh, look, <laughs> yeah, I, I did want to focus on that. I mean, I, I spoke about sanctions, but the other, the other part of it is reconstruction. I mean, making sure Ukraine wins this war and has the finances to, to, to do it, and then when the war ends, and it will end, uh, that it's in a financial position that that you know it's uh, it's got its creditworthiness uh, and it can borrow internationally at, at good rates. One of the problems we have at the moment, obviously, is this five billion dollar a month deficit and how it's been funded. Right, unfortunately, for the last few months has been essentially funded by debt, either central bank credits or war bonds or um, uh, official financing, but through debt. Uh, you know. The, the, the problem for Ukraine at the moment, if it continues this trajectory, is that at the end of the war, it will end up with a huge debt burden. Uh, you know, GDP's collapsed. You know, they're borrowing like crazy. You know, they'll end up with a debt GDP of under 100 percent at the end of the war. And they'll have to restructure, which will then set them back many years in terms of uh, their credit worthiness, their ratings and their, well, the cost of capital and their ability to borrow. So so I think it's really critical that Western countries, Western official creditors, basically provide grants and not loans. That's really, really important. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, the international community needs to, uh, you know, provide full budget financing so the central bank itself doesn't have to, uh, you know, monetize the deficit, which is it's what it's done. I mean, the central bank's done a superb job. The Ministry of Finance and the National Bank have been incredible throughout and, you know, must be commended for their management of the macro of the country. But in the end, you know, the West has got to pay the bill, right? Uh, you know, Ukraine should not be left with a huge amount of debt fighting our war. <laughs> so again, uh, the West needs to be providing uh, grants. Uh, and then, you know, post-war reconstruction, um, you know, uh, lots of different calculations about the cost in terms of, of uh, infrastructure destroyed, you know, probably hundreds of billions of dollars uh, you know, it's, it's really critical that we all think about how that's financed and funded and, you know, Marshall Plan for Ukraine is obviously a good idea. Uh, how the private sector gets involved in that is also, you know, critical. Um, I was on a call yesterday with a bank and a group of investors and uh, I was left with one takeout from another investor and he argued that from a private investment perspective, Ukraine is the number one, the best ESG story you could ever imagine as an investor, right? I mean, who from a private sector would not want to back Ukraine's reconstruction, you know, supporting democracy, human rights, I mean, everything good. Uh, sorry, my, my <laughs> machine's falling. Uh, you know, so it, it, it should be a great ESG story that guys like us, you know, uh, asset managers should want to support and we, we need to think innovatively about how the official and the private sector work together to actually put a lot of money to work to, to make Ukraine successful. Because, you know, Putin is intervening to, to make sure Ukraine is not successful, right? That it's not a successful model that other people, other, other countries across the FSU uh, would, would want to follow. Uh, just the second point, actually, and I, I was just looking at a tweet from uh, Schultz, the German, uh, the German chancellor, saying that... Um, you know, uh, Ukraine shouldn't have an automatic right to, to EU accession membership. I'd say the opposite. I, I mean, look, let, let's not beat around the bush. I mean, one, one of the reasons Ukraine has, has struggled and actually goes back to the third question you asked about, about accountability for, 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 uh, for investments in, into Ukraine and official financing. You know, it, it was in this no man's land between East and West. Uh, and actually, Mariana, you kind of pointed that out as well in terms of security, but also for, in terms of the economics, right? I mean, places like Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic have been hugely successful. I mean, their transition has been remarkable. And they were remarkable because they were given a proper EU accession perspective, right? From 94, Treaty, Treaty of Copenhagen. They knew that they were told what they need to do. They were told the framework and they had, you know, KPIs by particular dates. And they were told if they met them, they joined the EU by a particular date. Ukraine never had that. 
And I think it's really important that, you know, we, we push back. I mean, it's a bit difficult. I'm a British guy, so it's a bit hard for me to argue that, I, you know, we've been- Don't worry, we'll bring in the Swede. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, anyway, look, I, I mean, EU accession anchor is critical for successful economic development. And I think candidate member states, Ukraine has earned it. I mean, my God, they've earned it. You know, give Ukrainians a proper EU accession perspective, right? I mean, and then I think that everything will come together. I think, you know, we'll see a lot more uh, financial, well, a lot more investment into Ukraine, better checks and balances. You know, it'll all come together like it has in Poland, right? Uh, yes, excellent, Tim. But maybe indeed I will bring in Elizabeth to um, co perhaps connect security, EU membership and that predicament that Ukraine has, right? Because one of our participants says, do you agree that EU membership will be an important step for Ukraine's future security rather than unenforceable another Budapest type security guarantee? What would you say to that? It's, it's a, I think it's a fantastic suggestion. Uh, the, the, so the challenge the EU has is that it's a victim of its own success in that so many countries want to join and they get annoyed if another country gets precedence, right? So we all want to, to help Ukraine, but there are a number of countries uh, in the Balkans who have been waiting for a long time and, and are already sort of, well, in some cases, um, very attractive targets for, for Chinese charm offensives and, and uh, the Chinese uh, are already conducting charm offensives. So these are very tenuous uh, friendship links that we have with these countries. And, and the one thing that we can offer them that, that will convince that, that does convince them that it's worth sticking with us is the, the prospect of EU membership. And they've been at it for, for many years trying to join. And, and so if, if you were given, if we were to give Ukraine fast track access, if, um, um, nobody would would uh, would uh, argue that that Ukraine doesn't deserve fast track access. It's just it comes with these uh, unintended consequences, and I don't have to I have the answer to that. I, I I just wanted to flag it up because it's it's it will it create another headache for the European Union in what what we as the European Union uh, come up with to to keep those countries happy who will say well what what about us. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would be keen to hear if you have an answer to that, Oresia. I, I feel like well, I, I suspect I, 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 I don't have an answer, but, but my concern is that it's not just about the fast track um, procedure. It's, it's taking a political decision of actually granting Ukraine the candidate status yeah. that is still Absolutely. hanging, you know, in the air. Yeah. It's interesting, well, Olaf Scholz also says that now, you know, um, the, the integration of Western Balkans into the EU, it's in our own, meaning European Union strategic interest. It's about our own security, which we can't achieve without stable European Western Balkans. Can European Union have security without stable and successful Ukraine? And this is something that Andre was saying, where Ukraine is not a liability, or perhaps the West still believes it is, it's an asset, right? And then maybe because we have just one minute to wrap up, I'll give just a floor for final comments to Mariana and then to Andre to finish us up and then we'll wrap up. Uh, there's so much to discuss. We'll have another conversation around Don Siv. So the Mariana and then Andre final thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, just a couple of thoughts, you know, we, like in, in um, uh, academia, you know, we break up the uh, our interconnected and complex world into these disciplines, right? Security and economics are inseparable in real world. You need money to 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 finance your own defense production. You need rule of law uh, in order for these money for the money not to get siphoned somewhere up somewhere else. And you know, the whole EU project has been its greatest export was the rule of law into areas where it didn't exist before, right? To, to do this properly, I couldn't agree more with uh, Tim Ash uh, to say that, you know, uh, while, uh, while doing it quickly and fast tracking it, we really need to take care that it's done properly and it, in a way that it does export uh, the rule of law to Ukraine like it had um, elsewhere. With that, Ukraine will be in much better position to provide for its own security means, both you know, internally and independently, but also in engaging with foreign partners. Andri?
Andre, would you like to say a few closing remarks? There is a lot I would like to say, of course, but I value your time. And first of all, I would like to uh, thank all of you uh, and remind you that we are in uh, the 85th day of this large-scale war in Ukraine, and it should remain in the focus of attention of uh, the entire world, because unfortunately people get accustomed even to the war. We cannot do that in Ukraine, because while we are speaking here, I received a report uh, whereby in Chernihiv region, in the town of Disna, 54 people were killed in an in a missile strike and uh, there were a lot of wounded uh, and uh, thus we can expect those wounded to die in the very near future this terrible reality is ongoing it is with us and we should remember about it and one more thing, salient thing that I would like to raise uh, to comment on now. I mentioned it during my introductory remarks. The longer this war protects, the higher and more numerous the risks that it will engage ever more countries because our failure to uh, put an end to it, waiting till uh, the uh, Russian Federation realizes that it's uh, time for them to, uh, to stop its aggression, requires that Ukraine receives all of the necessary um, weapons and material. So, as I said, while this situation protracts, more and more people will uh, die. And, you know, people will grow ever more aggressive. And this aggressiveness will be observed inside Russia and powers that be in Russia who see that the conflict is going on, but uh, they cannot prevail in this conflict, will make them ever more aggressive. So I envision that Russia's next steps might and we hear it from uh, officials in uh, the Russian Federation um, that they threaten Baltic states and uh, um, Poland. So uh, we should concert effort in supporting Ukraine's victory, speedy victory. That's why all of the consultations underway amongst our partners about this new potential uh, treaty of uh, security guarantees should be accelerated. We understand that this security structure will be of multiple layers. There might be a general agreement or treaty and as I said, it should not be a new Budapest uh, memorandum, but it should be some general treaty spelling out the principle and clear cut guarantees for Ukraine. A lot of countries could exceed, and this could be a first step upon which we hope the agreement with Russia could ensue. 
right, uh, on ceasefire and um, peace with uh, the Russian Federation. And then we will be speaking about certain agreements on reconstruction of our economy. After that, we would be in a position to sign more detailed agreement on fundamental guarantees uh, to Ukraine. And I know already of some countries that uh, have uh, demonstrated their interest in participating. And that could be the foundation for the new security architecture. We can bring our house back in order and work jointly, not just on the battlefield, but while there is a, a war, we are already thinking how to uh, organize assistance. And I think it's important, I remember the first time you spoke calling about the urgency of the moment, rather than procrastinating and prolonging it, this conflict that will only entrench positions and make it more and more difficult. So I hope, ladies and gentlemen, we've gave you enough thought and ideas about how not to entrench this conflict for too long along the different frontiers from security to sanctions to, to assistance to Ukraine. And for that, I would like to thank our speakers, Andriy Yermak, Mariana Bunjarin, Elizabeth Bro, and Tim Ash for contributing your time. Stay tuned with Chatham House. Islava Ukraine.